Um, okay, at this time, we're going to jump into Luke chapter 6. This morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 27. And the last time, the message was titled, Blessings and Woes. And these were really principles of life for God's people. Um, you know, you hear certain things today that people say, and they're, they're worldly terms. You know, if you asked a person on the street what would be your impression of a happy life, and people will give you different answers. Some people will say, well, good health and wealth. Others might say happy wife, happy life. You know, you hear all of these little colloquialisms, but with, in blessings and woes, you really get to see what Jesus says is a fulfilling life, especially for children of God. Uh, this morning, the message is titled, Principles for God's People. And Jesus lays out uh, these sermons, uh, very powerful sermons. And, you know, sometimes in cultural Christianity, if people have never read the Bible, even not even the New Testament, they romanticize Jesus' teachings, getting little bites here and there. But we do, what they don't realize is some of the things the Lord calls us to do are very, very difficult. And it really shows us sort of a mirror, the void that we have. They're like, wow, how can I love my enemies? Like, Jesus, help, tell me how to do this. I'm, some of you are making faces already. Um, so what you find is that we have a spiritual deficit and what Jesus did before he kind of just let it all out, you know, presented himself as the Messiah, he sort of caused a vacuum, right, a void in people's hearts. And then when Jesus presented himself as who he was, well, his, him being the Messiah fills that void. And you know what? I know you've probably seen it. If you've been a Christian long enough, you've heard it. Even in teachings, there's two extremes. Here's the one extreme, right? Jesus teaches something that we should be paying attention to and apply to our lives. So the one extreme is sort of the Sunday Christian seeker mentality. Oh, that sounds nice. That's kind of romantic. And they go home and they do whatever they want the rest of the week. They don't apply it. Sort of the Sunday Christian attitude. The other extreme is to, and I've seen this done as well, is to take it to such an extreme where people put themselves in harm's way or harm's way to their family because they're trying to do something. And, and you, you see, Jesus did speak in hyperbole at times, but they're trying to do something that really wasn't the, the point of the Lord's teaching. So somewhere in the middle is really the, the sweet spot for what is Jesus telling us and what are we supposed to understand from this? Like what he says, take the plank out of your own eye. I mean, I work with lumber for many years and I don't think it's a 12 foot two by 12 that can fit in your eye. So there's a little hyperbole there, but you, you get the point. We're actually gonna cover that next Sunday. So we're gonna look at this in six pithy parts. So jumping in in verse 27, Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, who hear? Don't they all have ears? Aren't they all listening? That's a really good point. We can be hearing something, but not really listening to it. Because unlike the eyelids, we don't have ear lids. But sometimes we take in information and we don't process it, sometimes purposefully. So he says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the highest, for he, God, is thank kind excuse me, to the unthankful and the evil. Interesting little part there. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven." 
Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So one out of six is love your enemies. And he says it twice. Love your enemies. How does that feel? You know what I'm saying? In some Christian teachings, uh, the teachings are basically feelings-based. And that becomes a problem, and we're going to get to that. So, who has mastered loving your enemies? Please let me know. Anyone who's mastered, raise your hand so I can learn from you. Okay, my hand's not going up either, right? Um, this is impossible without God. And what Jesus did was he showed people, well, this is where God's heart is. And if you are children of God, you should share that same heart. However, if we're honest with themselves, we look in the mirror and realize I have a deficit. But as children of God, we say to the Lord, help me with this. Help me to fill that deficit. Please, you, God, fill that deficit in me. And here's a caveat, is that you can be doing everything right and still be looked at as an enemy, but you did your part. And I say this with forgiveness. You can forgive. You do your part. If the other party is still hostile, that's between them and the Lord. We can't control other people. So I know for me, I just need to do my part and be responsible for my actions and be genuine and be genuine. He says, those who spitefully use you, I love to go back into my Greek and Hebrew, and this can be translated, those who insult you, they slander you, they falsely accuse you. Now think about that person for a moment. Do you feel warm and fuzzy inside? Okay, <laughs> don't call out anybody's name, please. Uh, but this is where love becomes more of an action than a feeling. Is love a feeling? Sure, you love your loved ones and, you know, those close to you, and you, you get good feelings. But sometimes in a relationship, you just have to do the right thing, and you might not be feeling it. Love doesn't necessarily feel good when we're obedient. See, up at this pulpit, we're transparent, we're honest. We're just honest with people, right? It's not always easy. In some pulpits, they say, now here, this is what it says, now you do this, and there's no excuses. Sometimes it's a, it's a process. Uh, I hear this said a lot, and I, I understand the foundation in Scripture. A person says, I prayed about something, and it felt good, or I felt a peace about it. Well, if God is doing something in your life, he will give you peace, but be careful with that one. That could turn into, I don't do anything unless I feel good about it. That's what it can turn into, so we have to be careful with that. God can call us to do things that are sometimes, quite frankly, difficult. There's been times where the Lord has called me to uh, just call somebody out of the blue from my past, and... Uh, I could already feel my heart rate, you know, going up a few beats, and um, I have a little anxiety about that, but I, I'm pretty sure, I'm, and I know based on Scripture that I should be doing it. Maybe there's some type of impasse or whatever, and I do it, but, you know, it, it isn't as good as a time when me and my family are doing something and we're feeling really good, like the emotions are feeling really good. So God can call us to do something where there is a peace but how about when you call that person and they don't receive it well and they're nasty to you? It doesn't necessarily feel good emotionally, but it's something that we're called to do, right? Again, you're responsible, I'm responsible, and I've done this for my part. If it's not received well, I just move on. Amen? The other thing, as I said in my opening, is not lo or loving your enemy doesn't mean to put yourself in dangerous situations. So let's look at more here. Verse 29 through 30. We'll go over this again. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do, to, do not ask them back. So two out of six is give your cheek give your belongings. So the first part of this is personal. The second part of this is more material goods, right? In context, Matthew 5, which is a parallel teaching that Jesus taught, 
Jesus mentions, you, you know, the, an eye for an eye, right? This is embedded in Mosaic law, and the law was needed to keep society. This is where we have to, and again, this is a mistake that people make. What is the government's responsibility, and what is my personal responsibility? Right? We read Romans 13. We, we need police and, and military, and we need order to be kept. We need the courts, right? This even goes back to the times of Moses. So the government has its responsibility to deal with evildoers and keep them out of society. They don't always do a good job of it. But we also have a personal responsibility outside of that and how we treat people every day. So that's something that can get what I would say conflated. So Mosaic law was needed. Jesus wasn't coming as a revolutionary to overturn Mosaic law. He was not doing that. Order needed to be kept in society. However, however, sometimes personal relationships, right? Imagine if every Christian on the planet did some small ministry. Personal relationships and loving people can win a person and maybe change their hearts so they don't become a lawbreaker. So Jesus was kind of coming sort of at the other angle and saying, this is God's heart. It's a shame that God had to put all these laws in. It's a shame that you know, uh, God had to tell us to, to love each other. It's a shame. It's because of sin. But if we practice his heart, okay, we can change people one by one, or he can through us. And Mosaic law may not even be needed in that instance, because now they're a child of God, just like you are. Sometimes you can gain a brother or a sister through love. That's pretty powerful. Right? I, I noticed as a police officer for many years, I, I did some pretty, I would say, amazing things. I got medals for doing my job and, and catching bad guys and stuff. And then I became a Christian, and then I became a pastor. And boy, did things get challenging. Um, but I realized that if I would just listen to people, if I would love them, if I would... Um, I did a lot of human interaction when I became a Christian while on duty... And I noticed that some people changed and they weren't in the system so much anymore. So I literally practiced it in my job. Now, there were times I, I got warned and told you can't give people Bibles and it was some close calls there, but I felt that these are the things that I needed to do and I don't regret any of it. So, you know, what do you do, right? Are we a Sunday Christian or do we put this into practice, okay? Matthew 5 gives details of the slap on the cheek and turning the other one. Now, listen, I, I'm okay with this. Bible scholars, they disagree. Some say, well, it's literal, and some others say, well, this is more of an insult. If you look at the old English ways and, you know, even the old uh, days of, of, you know, Israel and stuff like that, uh, some of the Mishnahs and the Hebrew teachings mention these sort of types of insults. So these colloquialisms or these expressions have really stood the test of time for almost 2,000 years. But if you remember some of these old movies and um, accounts where they would take the gloves and psh, 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 on the face and they didn't hurt them, they didn't knock them out, but it was basically, it was an insult, right? Or the, the light slap with the back of the hand. It wasn't meant to knock the person out, it was just meant as an insult. Today, what's the expression that you hear? Boy, that was a slap in the face. <laughs> and I've said that. Oh, that was a slap in the face. I didn't actually get slapped. I have good reflexes, you know what I'm saying? But you, you're, you're taking something that seems to be physical, but there's a meaning behind that expression, okay? Slap in the face. Now, again, it doesn't mean that if at 2 in the morning a burglar is breaking into your kid's room, you just stand by and do nothing. You protect your child. That's not what it's saying. This is largely to um, insults, which even in Hebrew teachings, uh, they had a prescribed remedy to punish the person. And what Jesus was sort of saying that this was getting out of control. And even the religious people were abusing the courts and getting their pound of flesh in the courts by anyone who wronged them in any small way. And Jesus was saying, this is not God's heart. Whoa, if you want to be, you call yourself a child of God, we've got to look at this a second time. It's becoming corrupted, right? So you see these, these extremes here, and I've had this discussion with a few people over the last few months where I've said, don't have buttons to push, right? It's another expression. Oh, he pushed my buttons or she pushed my buttons, right? 
you can't take yourself so seriously. If you don't take yourself so seriously, then you have less buttons to push. Um, I said to one person recently, I said, I could come down from Sunday sermon and go out into the lobby and somebody comes up to me and says, I'm a professor, I'm a theologian, I have a master's of divinity, and that was the crummiest sermon I've ever heard that you just teach, taught, my English. So the first thing I would do is probably look around because we have a lot of pranksters. Who's recording this, you know? <laughs> is this a joke, right? And if that wasn't the case, I would say, did you get anything out of the scripture? And if not, I would pity that person. And the person's like, how do you do that? I'm like, I'm just trying to practice what I preach. Now, I wasn't like that as a new Christian. This took a long time for me to get to that point. But whatever, you think the sermon stinks, there's plenty of nice churches out there. Go find another one. It's not a big deal. I'll even tell you of a few. Maybe I wouldn't want to do that to the other pastor. But uh, so, so now we're going to move from physical and personal insults to belongings. Basically, my, you know... Don't, don't be asking for your stuff back, right? Again, is God asking us to empty your child savings bank account for somebody who's a con artist? The answer is no. That's an extreme, okay? However, do we need to go to World War III over belongings? Now, this, I can tell you that, and I've seen it in my family, I've seen it in other families, um, when a relative dies and they have stuff, and the piranhas come, they can sense the blood in the water. It's really disgusting, and it happens all the time. Some of you have experienced this. And, well, I want grandma's car. Well, I want her pearl necklace. Well, uh, I might be hitting home with somebody this morning. It gets ridiculous. And my attitude has been, after, over the last few years, we've lost loved ones. I'm like, if it's really that important, you just take it. I'm not going to fight over this stuff. You know, it's just stuff. And when anyone passes away, the, the, the person who, you know, you're going to find stuff in my garage I've never used. They're going to find the stuff in my basement I've never used, right? We can be hoarders sometimes. So all the stuff that we accumulate that we have to have, that we burn the relationship with our sibling over, is just sitting in our basement or our garage or a drawer somewhere that we forgot that we even had it under the linens, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, amen is right. <laughs> so... Uh, I'll just give you another example, and I like to use real-life examples. Several months ago, after hours, a man, sadly enough, who had, a, had problems, actually burglarized. He broke, in, he broke into this church, and I see on the camera, I mean, this was after the fact, he's walking out with like a little plastic bag. And I'm thinking, you poor guy. I actually felt bad for him. You burglarized a, a building. You took, I know all the statutes, right? Because I used to do this. I'm like, this is serious. I'm like talking to the camera. Why would you do that for a bag full of nothing? So then it got on the, on the Jamesburg wall, right? Because people know we, we feed people and stuff. And, and the community was outraged. And I said to my pastors, I got, I got to weigh in on this because there's going to be pitchforks and lanterns soon for this guy. So here I am. I'm becoming his defense attorney. So I'm telling the people, you know, just take it easy. He probably didn't know what he was doing. He probably was, and I even told the police, the police here are, are excellent. They eventually caught him. I said, listen, do what you got to do with your job, but I'm not looking for a pound of flesh. And as a matter of fact, I always try to find the silver lining. What did the guy do? He showed me, because I do the security around here, where our vulnerabilities were in the building. <laughs> and I fixed them. Thank you, sir. Now, this is going to be his defense, right? He's going to find this video and go, see, Your Honor, the pastor doesn't want anything done to me. It's like, oh, come on. Now we're going in the other direction. But, you know, I, in my mind, I wasn't angry. I didn't pound the desk when I found out. I just thought, I'm trying to figure the man out. Why would you break into a church and rob? If you came during hours, we'd leave you, you'd be out of here with like three or four bags of groceries if you needed them in clothes, you know? So, um, can't take ourselves too seriously. Jesus was not changing an eye for an eye. He said he didn't come to destroy the law of Moses, but the problem was the people's response showing no mercy when they were wronged. And that's what he was trying to, even the religious leaders, could you imagine them listening to this? Maybe feeling a little bit convicted about how they just stood on every letter of the law to get somebody back who wronged them, right? Um, and again, the personal responsibility versus what the government does, Romans 13, some churches do this. You know, we're against, in all cases, capital punishment. I'm not. This church isn't. 
uh, because some people are so evil and so wicked and victimize so many family and vulnerable elderly children that you get what you get. You put yourself in that position, now go before the courts. You know, I mean, would I go into the prison and talk to that person about um, receiving Christ before they died? I absolutely would. But the government needs to do its job to keep me and my congregation and my family safe. So they're two different things. So Jesus, right? What he was trying to express to people is the people had an idea, the religious system, the po political establishment of what they didn't have to do. And he was saying, no, 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 as children of God, these are the things that we do have to do. We have to be different. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, the apostle Paul even spoke about how Christians couldn't figure out some little matters in the church and they were going to heathen judges and it was a bad, wis a bad witness, you know. Uh, save the courts for serious matters, right? I've been in the courts for 25 years. I can tell you there's a lot of frivolous lawsuits. Like every day there are lawsuits. If you go to sue somebody legitimately, you've got to wait a while depending on the district because of all these frivolous lawsuits, you know. Some of these judges, I'd, I'd sit and watch the courts, and some of these judges had a lot of patience because just all the petty stuff of people in the town, and they just, the neighbor disputes, and it's just sad, isn't it, right? It's, people weren't loving their neighbors. And there's a lot of things going on here. Um, now, and then there were those times where the apostle Paul invoked his Roman citizenship, and you might say, well, how does that work? Well, because he was falsely accused of something, this is in the book of Acts, and he needed to continue to preach the gospel. And it wasn't the government that was trying to punishment, punish him. It was uh, civilians that were, again, bringing petty issues, really about uh, sharing the gospel to the courts to sh try to slow the Apostle Paul down. So he did invoke his Roman citizenship and said, I, I do have my rights in this situation. He really wasn't defending himself. He was defending how he needed to go out and share the gospel, and he was being hindered by pettiness. Um, Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers, not because Jesus was saying, I'm personally offended, but because what they were doing is they, were, they set up a gambling institution in the house of God. And Jesus was basically saying, in a nutshell, You're, this is a poor witness. And you wonder why people don't come to God, because you guys are, are the representatives, and you're doing a terrible job. Right? So there are going to be these situations where we need to have discernment to say, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Right? And that's something we pray about. So I'm not saying, and Jesus isn't saying never go to the courts. He's not saying that. But you know what? Save it for the serious matters. Verse 31, he says, and just as you want people to do to you, you also do to them likewise. This is what's known as what we would call the golden rule. Sort of a general principle. You see Jesus speak about specifics, and then he sort of oscillates. He goes back to a general principle, and then he'll go back to a specific. Jesus was the master of teaching. Like, if, you, if you're a teacher and you look at how Jesus did this, you're like, well, of course, he's God the Son. But incredible principles to speak in generalities, then to, to fine-tune them, then to go back into generalities, and then to go back into fine-tuning. Great stuff. It's how we learn. Right? You just you shift the mind and how it sees things. Macrocosmic, microcosmic, macrocosmic. So the golden rule is a general principle. And why is this so hard? Because in any culture, we look for reciprocity, don't we? Right? That's a relationship. If you're married and, and one party doesn't give it all and there's no reciprocity, you're probably going to be on a shaky marriage. Um, so reciprocity is important, but if you're interested in pleasing God, don't go out looking for reciprocity, is what he's basically saying here. Um, in this world, the attitude is, I'll do something, I'll do something good after I see how I'm treated. God says, do something good first before you know how are you going to be treated? Could you imagine if every person did this? If every single person in the world did good and blessed and showed respect first, there would be no wars, would there? There would be no hunger. Everybody would share what they had, wouldn't they? 
So if these principles were taking to its extreme, which would be wonderful, the world would be a different place. Amen? But at the very least, as children of God, this is something that we should be practicing. Now, there were already teachings, because I have people who study the first century and they have, um, you know, they, they try to challenge Christianity and stuff, and they'll say, well, there were rabbinical teachings and there were Eastern teachings that basically did this in the negative, not a value judgment negative. But in other words, don't do anything to anyone that you wouldn't want them to do to you. So this was already out there. Jesus puts a little spin on it, but a huge spin. Jesus, instead of saying, don't do something, you know, don't disrespect them and, you know, do that first. Jesus would say, do something positive, respect them, bless them. They have a need, help to meet their need. Not worrying about what you're going to get in return. You see the difference there? Right? It was already out there, the, the negative part of it, but Jesus turned it into a positive. And most people in society were like, wow, that's going to make me what? Vulnerable. Wow, if I help somebody and, you know, if I do, that's going to make me vulnerable. And 2022, New Jersey, this is a problem in the culture that we live in, isn't it? Right? You don't know who to trust. You see in the, the crime rates rise. You're seeing society kind of delve into, into chaos. And I, I will tell you this, though, this is the time to practice these principles. Because one day, right, we see the rewards. And there's some Christian teachings that say, if you do these things, you're, God's going to make you wealthy and healthy. And that's, it isn't a quid pro quo with God Almighty. You just do what, he, you know, Jesus came, right? And he died for the sins of the world before the world ever said, oh, Jesus, you've came, come to the planet. He really got a poor reception in many ways. But what did he do? He did first. He died for our sins to give us the opportunity to have eternal life. And now again, I'm not standing here saying this stuff is easy to practice, right? And it, it takes time. It really does. But it's something that we should want to do, and we should ask the Lord to help us to do. Verse 32. It says, But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Right? Big deal. This happens with the worst of people. This happens in, you know, violent gangs. This happens in um, criminal cartels. They do things for each other. So Jesus is like, it's really not that big of a deal. He says, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners receive as much back. But, says it the second time, Love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Four out of six is don't only love those close to you. Listen, I'm going to get personal here. Sometimes you all come from different cultures. I come from, uh, my grandparents were from Italy, and there's some cultural things that they practiced that they bring to the United States. And there were just some things that I had to say, you know what, as I was growing in my faith, they're worldly things, all cultures have them, but I'm like, I've got to put the Bible over some of these practices. Family, family's number one, blood is thicker than water. Really? Not to God, not to God. There's not going to be a deprosimo section in the kingdom or a Moore section, or a Whitehead section, or a Cardillo section. It doesn't exist. We are interspersed with the saints, and our job is not to be, oh, you made it here, you know, family kind of thing. It's to worship the Lord for all eternity. And, and people don't get that sometimes. But Jesus is very clear when he speaks about it. Um, in heaven, there's no bloodline. There's no last names. There's no race. There's no ethnicity. Oh, we see this all the time in the media. Just keep dividing people in their camps. Oh, that person looks like me. They talk like me. They eat the same foods as me. I feel comfortable. You could do social experiments. Look at the public schools. Look at the prisons, right? You look at even sometimes barbecues. You get a bunch of people together. It's a public event. And like people, 
stay with like people. That's not what we're called to do. And that what I just said sometimes rubs people the wrong way. Listen, God brings me a person. He's brought me black people, white people, male, female, Muslim, Hindu. They could be green, purple. I really don't care what they look like. When God brings that person to me, the light bulb goes off. I'm a pastor. I minister to them. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, um, a few decades back, took in a young Muslim girl who was in danger, and she was, in, she was pregnant, and we took care of her like she was our daughter, paid her bills, and 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 saved I was like a father to her now she's like in her late 30s um, but that's the person that God sent us right and maybe before Joe pastor Joe BC before he was a Christian maybe I fell into some of that comfort zones person does, has the same hobbies as me the same profession and I would stay into that sort of click but when I became a Christian I feel so much better because I love the diversity you know, I love the, the difference in people and learning about people and where they come from and their family and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty neat. Then I had my DNA done. I know this is probably too much information. I had a DNA test. I'm from everywhere anyway. You know what I'm saying? I'm from like three, three, at least three continents. So it just, it was a perfect fit. <laughs> so um, you could characterize this as, and I'm just, this is my paraphrase to us, Get out of your comfort zones when it comes to people. You could also paraphrase this as, give of yourself to others who may not necessarily be like you. Powerful stuff. Now this one, I scratched my head a little bit, I read it, and I'm like, wow, this is powerful. Jesus said, God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. That's an interesting statement. Do you ever hear or see or watch somebody on TV that blasphemes God? And the old expression, don't stand too close to me in case you get struck by the lightning bolt. Well, I've never seen anybody do that and get struck by a lightning bolt. And they're blaspheming the living God. And he has every right to do that, but he doesn't because he's kind. Because you ever notice that some of the, <laughs> uh, some of the worst people live, it's not always, right? Some of the worst people that have done so many bad things in their life, rip people off, they're just mean as a snake, they live a long time. I really believe that that's God's mercy in giving them every single opportunity that when they die, they had every opportunity to change and to repent. I always say that I believe that God gives everyone an opportunity to, for salvation. And if you find yourself in hell, it's because you don't want to be with God. You know, God is a loving God, right? But you don't want to be with God in eternity? Well, he'll make that happen for you. You don't have to be with me in eternity. We have another place for you. So, um, so that's where we're at. Verse 36. Could you, you could imagine, listen, we've had 2,000 years of these teachings. You could imagine the people, as Jesus spoke, looked at each other like, you hear what he just said? You know, just kind of, even the disciples sometimes, you read in the Gospels where Jesus is teaching and they, like, they don't think Jesus can hear, like they're whispering to each other. He's probably like shaking his head. I heard that, Peter, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so then Peter just started to say it out loud. <laughs> but they were perplexed by some of the Lord's teachings. But again, it's because we look at things when we're on this side of eternity, we get too comfortable with the temporal world. And Jesus had to come to shake everything up and say, this is the way it is up there, and this is way, the way in eternity. So people spend a long time in eternity. I need to shake things up a little bit. I really believe that. Was, did he say with a smile? Does, was he uh, kind? Was he generous? No doubt. But he also said the hard things that people had to hear. Verse 36, but, oh, excuse me, I just like that part. Uh, verse 36, therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. Five out of six. Be merciful. Can also be, and I use, do the translations, right, the semantic range. Merciful can also be translated be compassionate, be tender. What's the opposite of that? Being harsh, mean-spirited. Some people don't do church, never want to come to a church, and I experienced this. You know, I don't know their background. They're so hostile. And the light bulb goes off in my head, and I say, you know what? They had an, a negative experience with the church, somebody who goes to church, somebody who's representing God somehow, and nine times out of ten, that's Bingo, you know, that is the answer. 
Um, they don't do church because of negative personal ex experience they had with a self-professed Christian. That instead of driving people to God, they're driving people away from God. Right? And that's, that's tragic. It really is. For, because you know what? Church is not a social club. If you take the Bible out, you take God out, you take the Holy Spirit out of a church, it magically becomes a social club. And there's a lot of churches that operate without the things of God. They're parroting politics or, you know, the newest trend or social trends, and they're not a church, right? Because social groups are awesome, but when you put God into the center of it, it really becomes something that's conducive to uh, understanding, right, being the church, being believers, and, and saying, you know, I do want to apply this to my life. Verse 36, so be merciful. Uh, verse 37, continuing on, last two verses, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Now, on the positive side, those are two negatives. On the positive side, forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. That was an agrarian term, by the way. I love to look up these things. You know, they would, somebody would give you a sack of wheat or some grain or something, and if they really liked you or they were being kind to you or they were being merciful to you or if you were poor, they gave you a little extra. They would shake it, they'd press it down, it would be running over. They would give you as much as they could in that sack, and they would press it into your bosom so that you could hold it, put it on your cart, um, carry it home, whatever the case may be. So God, I, it's, it's kind of like a duh moment when I say, wow, God is such a great teacher. He's great at everything. But even these little things that the, if you were not educated and Jesus said this to you, you would completely understand what he said. He would use symbolism. He would use parables. So I like that. Um, just take, right? It's overflowing. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So six out of six is God's reciprocity reward. Now, some make the mistake, and even through bad motives, that it's, it is, you know, when we're, really, when we're Christians, we really just got to be close to God. Because sometimes our own motives, I mean, I could see it with myself. I would say to myself, Joe, why are you doing that? You know what I'm saying? You know, or why did you say that? I'm checking my motives. Um, and some would say, okay, I'm going to do these things because I now expect something from God. So the way they treated people looking for reciprocity, reciprocity well, surely if I do what God says, he'll give me this or he'll answer that prayer. Man, that's not how it works. You know, and a lot of these rewards, the Bible says, will be in heaven. Chalk it up. You know, <laughs> it went up there because you certainly are not going to get it here, right? And listen, we deal with difficult people. Maybe we were difficult people at one point. I'm actually going to share a brief story about that before I close. I don't mind standing up here in front of you and saying, yeah, I was the bonehead who did a lot of the dumb things. And I had to learn some hard lessons, even as a new believer. You know, the flesh or the worldly part of me still kept rearing its head. And I had to have good people and good teaching say to me, that's not how you're supposed to do it, or that's not why you're supposed to. And they were loving, so I still, to this day, you know, a few decades later, I'm still close to them. So, what's going on here? Verse 37, don't, you know, to judge and condemn it will be measured the same way back, in, back to you. Now, okay, this, this is something that I actually taught on judging. I'm not going to go into the whole teaching because I took a whole Sunday to do it, but uh, krisis, krino, anakrino, there were all these Greek words that had nuances to judging, but when they were translated to, to English, that if you look up the word judge and you look up synonyms, you'll find 50, 60 synonyms. Unfortunately, judging is one of those words that people mistake for something else and they use it improperly and out of context because the Bible sometimes says to judge and then sometimes it says not to judge and you say, well, what gives? So here's the, the range. 
judging has a very long semantic range in meaning. So over here is, if I'm judging, I'm saying I'm picking out who's going to heaven, who's not, it's way above my pay grade, so I should never do that. So to condemn or to judge or the final judgment is over here, that's not something for us to do. We shouldn't be judging or condemning. Okay, now let's go all the way over here to the lighter end of the semantic range. If I go to a 4-H, you know, I like nature and, you know, someone's got their roosters out and I'm at a 4-H fair and I'm like, I vote for that rooster and they get a little ribbon that's not worth much. And um, Okay, so what I just, I did judge the rooster, right? But who cares? It's cute, it's fun, it, it gets kids to get into, you know, farming and all that stuff. But it has no meaning on this life or the next. In the middle, which is something that we're called to do at times, is to make a decision about something, is to look at a situation or look at sort of some behaviors and not condemn the person, but to say to yourself, you know, through, through the Holy Spirit and Scripture, well, that, that's not right, and that's probably something that shouldn't be happening. Um, so that's what you have in the middle. So judging is a contextual word, and uh, we're actually going to talk about the the judging of fruit next Sunday because Jesus talks about that, right? So I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, but he's speaking about, again, somebody walks into a church, maybe they look a certain way, maybe their appearance, maybe it's a cultural thing, maybe it's uh, what everybody's doing, the youth, and, and they make value judgments on that person based on how they're dressed, and that's wrong. That's wrong. Or, you know, you, you feel that you have this self-imposed ordination to stand at God's right hand and decide who gets into heaven and who doesn't. That's also very wrong. So Jesus says, yeah, you shouldn't practice that. It's not going to be good. He says to forgive. We should forgive, right? Because if we look in the mirror, at some point, we've, need for, we've needed forgiveness. I mean, are we the perpetually offended or the perpetually stumbled? We're always looking around finding fault in somebody or who wronged me and stuff. I mean, that's just, I'll just use myself in ex as an example. Have you been offended by gossip? Have you ever gossiped? I know I have. So when somebody talks about me, and again, this didn't happen right away. It took a while for the Lord to show me, don't be a hypocrite. You've talked about people. Oh, yeah. I shouldn't make a big deal about it. And then, I, like the guy who broke into the church, like I'm trying to see his point of view. And the, it turned out he, was, he had a, a drug issue. He had a substance abuse problem. He was high when he did it. And I said, I hold no malice against the guy. He probably didn't realize what he was doing. Um, have you been offended by a bad attitude? Have you ever had a bad attitude? I know I have. Right? Oh, this is a good one in New Jersey. Have you ever been <laughs> cut off on the highway on Route 9 or the parkway? <laughs> Everybody's laughing at that one. Road rage incidents. Has someone ever cut you off? Have you ever cut anybody else off? I know I have. And I've had to go, oh, sorry. And, and they're gracious. Because what kind of, when you kind of do that, you're saying, my bad, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. Um, people get weird when they get behind the wheel of a car or behind their keyboard on the computer. That's why social media is so toxic. These, these people, like, they go back and, and you watch these strings. It's insane. So I would just say, you know what? Why don't you get out of the house? Why don't you two meet at a diner and talk? You'll probably love each other. No. And it's just, it's just ridiculous what's going on. And I, I often say, and it's a, it's a little ministry thing I have, don't go to war over Facebook. Right? It's, who cares? Right? Um, so there's a, there's a lot here. Grudge holding, it's been said, is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Think about that for a minute. Now, can I tell you something? That's actually what literally happens. When you harbor that anger and that resentment, because I've been there, I've done all the things that you're not supposed to do, so I can speak from example, and you harbor it, and you lay in bed, it's quiet, and your eye is open, and you're thinking about that situation, <laughs> and you know what you build up? Right? Fight, flight, rest and digest, parasympathetic nervous system versus sympathetic. I love anatomy and physiology. 
you actually develop when you hold these grudges and vendettas, I think that's an Italian term, and I could say that because I'm largely Italian, is you build up catabolic hormones that it, it, it keeps getting released into your system because your body thinks it's going into survival mode. And you know what, over time, it'll ruin your digestive system. It'll ruin your uh, endocrine system, your, your adrenals. It's bad stuff, folks. And, and I used to live like that. And I'm so glad the Lord delivered me from that. Just whatever, whatever. I, I didn't know I could rent that much free space in your head if you're talking about me all the time, but just come to me. If I did something wrong, I'll own up to it. I'll just leave you with this, and then we'll, we'll kind of finish up. Is that, so my pastor, I told him I was going to talk about him today, Pastor Lloyd, Calvary Old Bridge. Um, a few weeks back, he asked me to help him put a gazebo up because he knows I'm very meticulous. So we were working on the roof panels and the structure. It was kind of funny. So I don't know why I've, do, I've done this once before. I'm like, you know, Pastor Lloyd, now we're like, we're simpatico. We're, we, we compare sermon notes and stuff. It's really cool. It's a, different, it's a different relationship now, now that I'm a senior pastor. But I said, you know, I know I was difficult as a new Christian. And even when I first started the church, and I, you know, I said, I really put you through a hard time. And he kept saying, oh, no, you weren't the worst. <laughs> so, so then I'd push it a little bit more, and he got, no. He goes, I don't remember, no. So I came to the conclusion, if you're listening, Pastor Lloyd, he either has a really bad memory <laughs> or he's very gracious. And I think it's a little bit of both. So I'm, I'm trying to read his expressions. Is he, is he pulling my leg or is he just being nice? So I just felt I needed to say that to him. But can I tell you something? We're going to flip-flop roles. You, you live long enough. If you're the offended one, oh, give it enough time. You will be the offender. So this is why we need to be gracious. If we've done wrong to own up to doing something wrong, and if we've been wronged, to be, to be gracious to the person who's wronged us. Even 20 years ago when I started out as a pastor, I, I have some memories and I cringe. I'm like, you know what? I didn't know all those lessons as well as I know them today. And I wish that I would have handled certain things differently. Because this is life, folks. This is peace. This will keep us from staying awake at night, worrying about who's talking. You know, some people say, oh, I think... I think uh, I had 10 more friends from Facebook last month. And I say, I don't even know how many friends I have on Facebook. If, you, if you're bothered by my post or you're, you, I annoy you and you don't want to come to me like Matthew 18, I don't care. I, don't, I could have 50 less friends. Honestly, I don't even know how many friends I have on Facebook. So, and if I've offended anybody, come talk to me. I'll own up to it. Or that post was insensitive or whatever. Um, this, is, this is good stuff. So let's just go back to verse 38. To, to have this running over, this is how God blesses us, this overflow, right? We talked about this. You can never lose when you give too much. God rewards the generous heart. Pastor Sam, I'm glad he's here. Where is he? There he is. If you know Pastor Sam, one of his famous Pastor Sam-isms is you, count, you can't outgive God. He says it all the time, right? God rewards the generous heart. The measure we use, if we have a measure of condemnation, cruelty, stinginess, it'll be measured back. Again, I used to be stingy as well. If you owed me five bucks, my wife will laugh. I said to her, why did you marry me back then? <laughs> you know, I'd have like a little piece of paper that said, uh, James owes me $5, you know. <laughs> Give it another week and then it's, now I could care less. I've been beat so many times for money, I can't, that's not a good thing to say. People are going to be coming up to me, hey, can I borrow 300 bucks? <laughs> can, can we all take this in, 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 you know what I'm saying, in context, please? You know, <laughs> okay. Um, if... <laughs> Not, let not this get out of control. If we measure with, if we exude mercy, forgiveness, generosity, that'll also be measured back, right? We truly reap what we sow. And the question is that we have to all ask ourselves is, what am I sowing? Or if you're wondering, why am I reaping this? 
Maybe it's a little time for self-reflection. Again, this is not just for clergy. This is for everyone who calls themselves a believer in Christ. These are principles for God's people. And a good understanding is that not like Jesus is holding us down, like Jesus was so gentle, but this is more of an inner disposition. So this teaching, I would look at it as Jesus saying, you know, this is an inner disposition that my followers should have. In John 14, and people do this, oh, you know, I'm, I love God, I love Jesus, but are you just saying that? Because in John 14, Jesus said, if you truly love me, you follow my word. You follow my teachings, right? And when we fail, we go to our prayer closet and say to the Lord, I failed. And I'm not happy with myself because I know that you're not really pleased with my behavior yesterday. This is a disposition that's generated in our spiritual side that permeates the psychological and eventually, as I said before, this, the physical side and what you do with your hands and feet. Just like at the time of Christ, today this would be tremendously helpful to society if every Christian practiced it. You want the application and then we'll close? You read the news, you see what's going on, you see all of our disaffected youth, you see the depression rate, you see the suicide rate. Oh, believe me, there are, nobody can say, oh, I, I don't know, I, there's nobody I can, let me tell you something, in this world, a lot of people are suffering. A lot of people don't know God, and you, the only thing they know is this world, and they're suffering more. Because our leaders and world leaders, they don't have the answers. The answers are found in here. How many times do you guys, I'll look at the video, how many guys did you guys break out in laughter this morning? We come to church, we have fun, we have joy, right? We, we laugh at ourselves. Don't take ourselves so seriously. So this is definitely, 2022 in New Jersey, this is definitely a good time to practice these principles. And we may be rewarded here. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but we will definitely reap incredible war rewards in the kingdom. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you're so awesome. Lord, you, you know, you, you even gave us, you did give us a sense of humor, and it's just, it's just good to be lighthearted. It's good to not be so serious all the time and not so you know, uh, perspicacious and just all these things that we do that we make ourselves crazy. Uh, Lord, you, you gave us an out. You gave us a way to, to let go. You gave us a way to not take ourselves so seriously. Um, you gave us a way to love others and reap incredible rewards in the kingdom, Lord. I just pray right now while the worship team is up here, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I would just ask that you would come up to the front as the worship team plays and, uh, you know, we'll lead you verbally in a, a prayer of faith, a prayer of receiving Christ. You don't go to God through us. We're not mediators, but we're just here to show you the way. And then you enjoy that walk with your Lord through those dark times, through those times where you feel you don't have one friend. He's always going to be with you. But most of all, he died for your sins. And he provided the way, the only way for us to get into the kingdom. So I just want to ask anybody here, if you'd like to come and receive Christ, to come up here, maybe someone will come up with you. Receive Christ and enjoy him. You come. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to be. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful. Take my love, my Lord, I
your feet its treasure store take myself and i will be ever only all for me anybody want to come forward and receive christ if you have questions people have questions i did um back then certainly see me after service you know you you might feel a tug to come up and i believe that's god's holy spirit working on you but you also may have questions and that's fine sometimes we can just question things to death we should just come and receive christ but i'm more than happy what's this going to look like what do i do you know not a problem we can talk about that um but see me after service if that is your concern um, at this time, the elements for communion will be distributed.